Morning, everybody, and welcome to Strategy Cafe, um, your shot of leadership inspiration from Alembeck. Um, really pleased to have uh, so many new subscribers this month. Um, as you know, the cafe is our monthly uh, leadership podcast, Strike Magazine. Uh, we try and pick up interesting topics and um, particularly love interviewing successful leaders for their tips on getting better performance from your team and your business. So our hope is that you find it all useful and inspirational um, for your own leadership challenges. Um, and those of you who know us well will know our purpose is to help you as a leader to lead better, which is a real mix of getting your strategy right, um, getting the implementation right, and then supporting you with that delivery. And one way we do that is to help you understand leadership and growth options. And this is just, I think, just a really nice way to connect with you all, uh, share our thinking, um, to be honest, really pleased to hear your suggestions for subjects. Really want the questions as well. So if you're watching with a computer to hand and you, or, you know, you've got able to sort of um, work with the dashboard, uh, there's a questions area. Please post them up and we'll, and we'll take them uh, towards the end of the session. So uh, that's the introduction. Just in a second, we're going to introduce you to Russell, um, a little bit about him there. And today's session is really around um, leading as a coach. Um, we'll run up until about sort of five minutes before the hour and then take some questions. And then just to wrap up on what's coming up next, we've got some exciting things coming up that you can join in with. So um, uh, hopefully you will fully partake in those. And today's session is being recorded. So uh, if you want other people to see it back at the office, you can jump up on YouTube later, subscribe to our channel and get the notifications. And this will be uh, up there probably mid morning along with the other ones. So, um, Russell, uh, welcome to the Strategy Cafe. Do you want to tell us a little bit about you? Hey, Nick. Yeah, thanks for having me. Can't believe it's uh, been a month since we last met. Um, yeah, well, even I got excited by seeing the picture of me skateboarding. So, uh, yeah, I'm, um, I, I used to be, sorry, I just as your previous slide said, I used to work for the RFU. I worked um, in player and coach development. Um, I'm now working uh, in lots of other environments in a similar mould really around people development with Google, British hockey, doing some stuff with FA, with some football clubs. Uh, I guess my background is I, I played sport, uh, I loved it, uh, had great fun, had a, you know, probably a, a rugby career that could have been better. Uh, if only I'd known what I, what I know now, and that's a question I asked to uh, the coaches a lot if you um if you knew what you knew then if you knew what you know now as a coach would you have been a better player then and the answer is well it's always yes so i mean I, i'm sure we'll touch on it in the webinar but one of my views is that we should be getting players or people in our organization or students in school that think a bit more like coaches like leaders like teachers so and also now founder of the Magic Academy, so I've got a slide on that a little bit later on, but I think that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful idea. And uh, also a um, Cambridge Maths and Economics graduate who became a rugby player, so quite, quite, <laughs> I know, quite it's a, it seems like a different world. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the Magic so Academy, we, sorry, I was going to say, yeah, we just, is a coaching site, it's a global coaching yeah. community, really, two and a half thousand coaches, it has that kind of underground gorilla feel to it uh, which i quite like i know we were last time we chatted i was talking about a few groups i'm involved in so i'm on the the alive coaches society which is and someone else's version of the dead poet society and it's you know similar lots of little groups where we're challenging and supporting uh, one another to be better leaders really that, that's a nice link, uh, sort of uh, one show segue to this uh, this slide here. The next generation of leaders needs to be better than you. We were chatting about this over coffee in preparation. I just really love that comment. Um, I think you were talking to a group of partners, but um, just curious, um, you know, why did you say that? And um, like the slide says, you know, what are the challenges? How are they changing? How do we as leaders need to respond to the sort of changing leadership world that we're in? Yeah, and it was exactly that. Um... It was, you know, I do a bit of work with a few businesses and one of them really was about how, a, you know, well, what does the future look like in this world and what would leadership or influence look like in the future? So um, it's it's then getting them to, you know, would in the future clearly the, the people who lead this business are going to have to be more capable than 
the people who currently are because just of the ever-changing nature. Just look at something like Brexit at the moment and how it's meaning that people need to be really skillful, really adaptable. So it was really that, and it's also, I mean, it's, it's engagement. So your, your best talent in an organization, well, unless they're given opportunities to have responsibility, to develop themselves, to become the best they can be, then they'll go somewhere else, um, which is fine if that's, you know, that's, I mean, lots of organizations would get excited about developing their talent and their talent moving on, but certainly this organization would want to develop people from within um, and, and make them better than the current partners. I think that's right, and I think the attitude to sort of traditional norms of leadership has shifted a lot. Um, people talk about the next generation, but I think the impact of the sort of global global wave of um, technology change just in the last decade or so has had a massive impact on the way people think about life, um, about what they're up for, and it has shifted attitudes. And it feels like jobs of the future, careers that people search for, are going to be very different, and that flexibility is a really key point. I think this, I think it's coming up, but this next slide. Uh, kind of speaks to that, doesn't it? Oh, is it the, uh, I can't see it on my, is it the one with the sheep? Is it the one with the sheep? It's the one with the sheep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, I mean, and, and, and I would see it a lot in coaching. So, um, okay. because we are, you know, because we're experts in what we do and because of how our brains are wired, you know, so that they can solve things relatively efficiently. If there's one answer, then we come up with one answer. So there's, there's no fence, the sheep continue to do what they do. In coaching world, that might be that in rugby, we continue to use tackle bags because when they're nothing like making a tackle. In business, that might be just, I know we chatted about it, having long meetings with a fixed agenda in, a, in, the, in the boardroom with no light where people are slowly dozing off um, because that's where we've always had the meetings. So um, it might be that we could think differently. So a good, good example with one of the businesses I'm working with is how they do their PDR process. Now they've just asked the people who are owning the PDR process, how would you like it done? And they're, um, they're an ecology firm. One of, the, one of the current employees likes to do their PDR in a pond. Um, feels better connected with nature, I guess. <laughs> it's really unusual. I think this is a really good point. So, um, I mean, um, in, even in, in, in our space, we see people trapped by agendas. For example, um, so you, um, um, what I mean by that is maybe you have a routine agenda, maybe it's items one to ten, maybe they're always the same item, maybe there is some change on that. But um, even that idea, the idea of a sort of an agenda, prevents um, people coming together to discuss what might be really important in that day or give it enough time. Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me of Danny Kerry. So Danny <clears throat> Kerry, for those people that don't know, was um, was coach of the women's hockey team that won gold in in the last Olympics, um, and he said, um, after London 2012, one of the players came up to him and said, you know, they, they, they didn't win gold in 2012, and one of the players said, I don't know how we didn't win that. You know, we had the plan. We knew what we were supposed to do. At yeah. which point, Danny knew that he'd, you know, he'd just overplanned it, really. So he talks yeah. much more now about having a direction of travel. And so I was thinking with a meeting, well, maybe it's just one of the questions we need the answers to. Um, as opposed to it's this, it's this, it's this. And also maybe even if we had less meetings, people might talk more. They yeah. might actually don't have to have those conversations one-to-one -one or, or whatever it might be, as opposed to us formally having to organize meetings. I um, So this next one is about creativity and just different ways of finding finding that flexibility, that creativity sort of problem solve in the moment and um, you know, changing the idea of meetings to being things that uh, where we come together to solve problems rapidly and we face into the issues we've got right now. Yeah, and look, this is probably a, a, a collage, I think that's the right word, of, of some of the stuff that we were certainly doing in in rugby terms, and I'll probably try and translate some of it to business as well. So the picture down the bottom, so the, the small chap in the middle is Marcus Smith. At 16, at 14 years of old, he was too scared to tackle, stood on a wing, not talking to anyone. At 16, he couldn't get in his county team. Two years later, he was in an England squad. So yeah. one, of our one of the ways I would set people challenges is, for example, if you're most talented, whatever that means in your organization, um, a person coming up through the ranks um, 
if I said to you, every single person needs to be as talented as that person, um, or you lose your job in a year's time, well, you might think differently about how you develop people. So in uh, in the com one of the companies that I work with, ecology part of the, of the business, they earn a lot of money in, in the summer months. So apparently that's when the bats and the, the newts are out. And the challenge was you've actually got to go and earn more money in the winter months and in the summer months. What would you do differently? So yeah. actually they then start to think, oh, okay, well, we could diversify into other industries. We might try this. And actually just probably get them out of the river of thinking. So I think that's a good way to do it. In a sporting context, it might be saying to someone like Eddie, well, you've got to beat the All Blacks 100 now. And we would think differently about that question than we would about just a small iteration of just beating the All Blacks. So um, that's why I put that slide in. The other stuff is probably, so the cards, um, I use challenge cards. I sat at home one night, I thought, how am I going to, change some behaviors, how am I going to support people better? And I just individually set challenge cards for everyone. So when we were in camp for the week, they would then receive a challenge card based around strengths, based around areas they would like to develop, and then we'd chew the fat on an evening. So a good example might be uh, go and spend time with the three people you know the least. Go and find out some stuff about them. Uh, we also had Big Dave, the physio, who's ironically very small. I think that's why he's called Big Dave. And Dave was only allowed to have lunch <clears throat> with players that were fit, because obviously he spends a lot of time with players that are not fit. Um, the, the one with the van is is them writing down their challenges for the session. So the number one thing for coaches or leaders to dial up if you want to increase motivation is choice. So giving it's a bit like putting your daughter, my eight-year-old daughter, if I wanted to go to bed in ten minutes, I'll say. Do you want to go to bed now or do you want to go to bed in 10 minutes? And I get what I want. However, yeah. he has choice. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just giving them, you know, just giving them more choice, giving them responsibility. Um, the, the bottom left, the guy in the Target T-shirt is really, that's one of our best players. So Foxy's wearing a Target top. People get extra points for getting shots on Foxy. So I guess it is the same. How are you challenging your best people? How are you making them be even better than you. Um, and then probably bottom right ties in with your meeting. So we would do, you know, we talked a lot about what meetings could, uh, should look like as a real paradigm around <clears throat> the layout of the room. We, we, we definitely try to challenge that. Uh, there's probably a paradigm around there's one expert in the room. Perhaps everyone's an expert because they're all seeing lots of things we don't see as leaders. So. That was actually a meeting we ran where the kids came into the room in Leeds and they just received a brown envelope and they then had to work out in their teams where we were in Leeds. We were about seven miles away having a really nice cake and coffee. Um, they had to work their way there and buy a present and the best present. And so we then just debriefed it in terms of, you know, how did you find solutions? How did you work together as a team? When did you demonstrate resilience? So there was a couple of kids that found it tough. The kids came up with some really innovative solutions. There was some phone tracking going on. There was some haggling with taxi drivers. <clears throat> and that was actually the best, um, the best, that won the best uh, award. And that was, a, that was a landline that connects to your mobile phone. Um, I definitely felt like we had much more transfer, much more impact from that meeting on the cohesion, on the understanding of the group, from, from creating an experience for people as opposed to meeting the you know, that can often be very similar to other leaders. Yeah, we um, talk about it as um, learning by doing um, and, um, you know, being, being uh, you know, as, as the leader or as the leader coach, being in there amongst the uh, group that's got the learning to do, but um, taking them straight into their real day-to-day -day challenges and then and then helping helping live, watching them tackle it and helping them understand how they're tackling it and how to do better live. Uh, it's very, very dynamic and different kind of approach to, to learning and development. Yeah, I mean, I, can I, I was just going to just trigger me on one thing there, Nick, if it's okay. Um, the other thing to think about there is could you go and find a related world? So yeah. I've referenced hostage negotiation a lot. So in terms of impacting coaches and leaders and people who are hierarchically at the top and think they're experts, hostage negotiators will be the number one people at building rapport um, yeah. and perhaps behavioural change. Uh, yeah. So I spent a bit of time 
taking uh, Marcus Sheesby as a hostage negotiator into some of these environments and just, you know, setting them the challenge. You know, you got a phone call from someone. This is the situation. You've got 30 seconds to plan it. And then actually taking out some principles. So some principles around language, some principles around how do you prepare, how do you reflect on on conversations, on meetings. And it's also quite nice to, to go out of your world because the challenge is if we do it, always do it in a, a rugby or our business context. And we'll always have this kind of power hierarchy. So the people at the top will think they're experts. Um, and other people lower down, I'm using the word lower down, I'm being deliberately provocative. Uh, they may not speak, they may not voice their opinions. Um, I just, so we were talking about this one, we were talking about uh, how even just a label can um, make you unfortunately get a new blind spot. So if you get appointed as a senior in a senior position, Suddenly, that changes the way everyone interacts with you, um, what they'll talk to you about, changes your focus, what your attention is put onto. And so uh, it creates a bigger focus around your direct leadership responsibilities, but then immediately takes away your visibility on loads of stuff that you had before. So um, that idea that there's lots of expertise around and as a leader, you need to be vulnerable and open so that you still create that wider visibility. I love that point. I think this slide kind of speaks to that. I just wanted to yeah. say to the audience, sorry, I think we've lost the uh, the um, the visual link to me and Russell this morning. We've got a few connectivity problems, but hopefully you can still see the slides. Okay. Just on this, it's just around vulnerability. Yeah, well, I can see myself, so that's uh, <clears throat> that's exciting for me. Um, yeah, and, and I guess it's, um, it's probably why the, the show Undercover Boss exists. So I've, a good example of where I've seen it is actually um, the other day I, I set, uh, I was coaching at Abingdon School and I set three of the players the challenge of coaching other players and they immediately put their arms behind their back because they were suddenly playing the part of this hierarchical person. An activity I do, which is a nice activity and might be worth something people could take away is actually everyone gets a card uh, with a number on between one and ten and then without speaking you go and act it out so if ten is the boss and one is who whatever you think the person at the bottom of the hierarchy is then go and play that person so walk around the room then try and find people like yourself so and then also look at the impact of others so how do they make you feel as a really good activity for leaders i would often give the leaders the zero or the one so they can experience some of the body language they're often portraying um, yeah, and I mean, these pictures probably bring it to life. Um, I really like bottom right. So that's Mark Luffman, who coaches in the England pathway, and that's a heavily bearded 17-year-old young man, um, Marcus uh, Street. Um, and, and that's been well thought out. So that's a one-on-one -on -one kind of meeting. It's really comfortable. They're on beanbags. They are, you know, both at the same level. They're not facing each other. So often that face to face that's how I, that's how i envisage a, a typical pdr process to look it's face to face someone's writing notes that can be quite a stressful position especially for a for a younger person um the one in the middle is peter walton also coaches in the pathway and that that's just a really informal line out meeting with condiments um top right would be we would try and gamify lots of this stuff so that would be the areas we're trying to work on so if, if Rusty is dealing in extremities, if I'm talking about always or never or um, definitely, then and someone notices that, they would say pineapple. I could, I could get things taken off um, by, by using my super strengths as well. And that would be there for everyone to see. So actually, that's the whole organization is, is aware that the people who are perhaps deemed to be nearer the top of the organization are trying to get better. Um, I love that. I think that's I think that's a really uh, good tip to everybody out there. So sometimes you feel like you have to be superman or superwoman if you're in a leadership role. You have to hold responsibility. Um, feels like it's all pointing at you. And a really neat way around that, which actually is just really effective leadership, is this point of um, uh, actually acknowledging that you don't know. Uh, you may have lots of expertise about the past, but um, tomorrow is unknown. And you're, you're likely to be a little bit blindsided. Uh, so um, being vulnerable and open to that and sharing that with uh, the team, um, it, I just think that's a lovely point for modern leadership. It, um, 
if you can be vulnerable, it signals to them that it's okay for them also not to know and it takes all of that pressure out and we can just become, I think, more, more honest um, with each other about what's going on and then make it fun. Uh, it's it's uh, great tips and I think um, one of the things we were chatting about was about difference so this kind of feeds into that really nicely so you've got that lovely bit at the bottom about motivation the Maslow stuff and what's in it for me but I also really like this next um, kind of slide which is just sort of alluding to um, different personality types um, whether you embrace that so how do you use this in sports yeah I'm just probably to tag on to the last slide really um, modeling it would be key um, I was with a business in uh, Dublin last week and they started off the whole event with the leader saying, look, this is the stuff we've been working on. Here's the stuff we're finding hard. Here's the, and it was, it just opened up everyone to being really honest. And yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a great intervention. Uh, yeah. How we've used that really is, so it's, um, it's insights, it's, um, it's preferences. Um, Really to understand how we're similar and how we're different, probably to better value what people bring to teams. So clearly, um, lots of people listening be working as part of a team, and it's it's not about trying to make everyone the same. It's about going, well, do you know what? I probably need to hang out with some people who have some different strengths to me. So people who would probably be relatively well organised would help me a lot. Um, uh, yeah, and, and then it just gives us a common language. And, and, and let's be mindful that we don't want that language to become labels. Um, so used correctly, it would help understand, you know, <clears throat> how can I best communicate with other people? Uh, what's the likely things that would stress them? <clears throat> so that could be used both ways, really. So I'm thinking with my coaching hat on, I used to coach uh, England Sevens, and James Rodwell would be, he would be in the kind of, he would be high blue energy. Um, he would like process he would like information he would like time um, I would like to take them away from him because that would replicate the game more so actually being aware of what his preferences are how I could use them to potentially stress him and then observing him and supporting him with solutions to that um, it's just I guess it's you know that would be a, a live example of how we've used that I think being a being a, a coaching leader, you've got to um, be non-judgmental and take everybody as they come uh, in the first instance, haven't you? And you've got to look for how they bring strength to the team and look for where the weaknesses are that need to be uh, protected. You've got to be open to that. Um, and I think the other thing we're chatting about is this. So um, you'll have to tell everyone who this chap is. Uh, Tom Marshall, I mean, yeah, I'm probably just triggering on from you from what you said there that is coaching so I hear lots of coaches put labels on people lots of leaders put labels on people he's this he's that she's this she's that she's not this um, I think my two bits of advice always would be think individually and think longitudinally so don't think where this person is now think of where with your support they could get to yeah think who they're becoming um, and this is Tom Marshall I mean and this probably brings to life some of the complications around it. So clearly, as we looked at last time, everyone would have would be different. Every single person on the planet would be different. And then they also have this kind of support structure or network of people around them that are going to be influential. So if we're thinking about behavioral change, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a good example, then I'll talk about this slide. So we would have lots of players in the England pathway whose dads were international rugby players. So of course, they're going to have some say in. They're definitely going to be having some conversations in car journeys. When we asked the, the 420 kids who were at the Wellington Festival, so that's 420 of the highest potential kids in the country, who was the most influential person in their rugby journey? Coaches came forth after dad, mum, teacher. So I think we've got to be really mindful that when we see this person before us, so if this is a person in your organisation, there's lots of other people around them. So this is some people like their coaches in this form, their s &C, their analysts, their medical, their, their friends, their teachers. And, and that will be exactly the same in business. So two things really. One is um, let's think about how can we support those people as well. Uh, and probably the main thing, so in this instance, Tom Marshall, he will be an excellent example of this. 
how can we give people like Tom Marshall the skills to kind of just work with these people and go, well, I'm hearing this, um, and I'm hearing this, you know, how do they, are they the same, are they different? What do you mean by this? Because this person's saying this, and as, you know, with a, when you've got millennials in your organization and they probably not as old and, I was gonna say wise as us, but they're definitely not as old as us. They're still finding out who they are. They're still trying to understand themselves, where they fit in the world, how they find meaning in their lives and to have lots and lots of people giving lots and lots of information, often different information, can be very confusing. Um, and certainly isn't going to lead to good performance. Yeah, so as a coach, uh, like the tip would be just to ask about that. So if you've got your person you're know, trying to help, trying to develop, then you've got to know, and this slide is so good at, good at sort of showing it, that they're going to have a lot of significant others who are who are in, involved in the debate in some way and it's just asking isn't it and finding out um you know what are you hearing about this from you know from the other people in your life and uh, who you know and then who are they and how can i help with that yeah i really like uh, john fletcher who I, who I work with now and he would he would talk about knowing knowing everyone not everything so actually yeah. spend time asking people how are they feeling spend yeah. time noticing so actually, as people walk in, is there anything different on a good day? How could we, you know, bring to life what that looks like on a good day? How could we get them to be feel more like they do on a good day more often? Um, so I want to I want to just push on a little bit, just mindful of the time. So just quickly, you just want to touch on on how to do that with feedback. And um, I think this is like uh, your version of getting feedback. It's like tons of feedback from lots of different people, isn't it? And this is the 15th. This is one person. So this is one person's is, feedback to you. Yeah, yeah. So Ed Robinson came into a camp and uh, and shared this feedback, and it would fuel all my biases. I mean, feedback for me is it's from them to us. So how can we understand what they're thinking, feeling, unless we ask the question? Um, and it's about how it's received. So if someone had sent me a 20-page essay with really small font, no lines in between, versus this, then this is this is resonating more with me this is actually engaging me so yeah. i would think about as a you know how often have you asked you know how do, how would you prefer your feedback well you know when uh do you want it in the moment where would you want it in a group or would you want it individually so just understanding that is is really useful for people and this one is one of your um you know one of your connections just so this uh, i love this idea of as the leader being really open about what your own goal is and then pushing out your document which is your control and asking people around you to just be fit you know to be positive to be direct to maybe be fierce with you but to hold you accountable i love the idea of a leader rather than saying okay i'm a leader now i don't need to worry about that actually pushing back out and saying look hold me accountable uh, yeah. And this is good for uh, that, I think, isn't it? Yeah, this is Kaz Morgan. So Kaz is now with the first team. He's analyst. He's a rock star. Um, but this would be his development plan. He would share it with everyone. It's his own. He owns it. <clears throat> what sits behind it is relationships. So he would send this to me and go, Rusty, I want you to challenge me on this. And, and here's the areas you can support me. Uh, one yeah. of the things, I think it's the next slide. We just did a bit of work with on the technical directors with the FA and. In, in a spare 10 minutes, I designed this for them and they loved it. And the, what we then did was, so we, we looked at what are the big rocks? What's the stuff they need to do? Why, how? Well, clearly the left-hand side, I wanted them to celebrate the stuff from the course they'd enjoyed and their successes. And then probably the key bit on making it sticky was who can help me. So we then got them to text those people or send them the image and go, look, I'm gonna chat with you in the next few days about this. I'd love a bit of your time. So actually, let's make this sticky. Let's involve other people in it because clearly with behavioral change, if you go away and it doesn't go quite so well, then you're probably going to need some support. So this would hopefully help people with the support. It's a great, it's a really great framework. I love it. And I love the idea of feedback being an ongoing, continuous process rather than some sort of form-filling exercise, but nevertheless, just capturing it like this on one page. And I just wanted to pick up a question from Juan Mendia to you, which is, um, you know, how do you know learning is taking place? And I think maybe this this last slide, which is about, I mean, tell us what this is about. How how can you tell that learning is taking place? Yeah, I mean, in, in answer to Juan's question, it's um, we talk a lot about transfer. You would only, in our world, only in the game, you know, would you see it? So repeatedly done in a game, in business, it would be, Often when you're the most stressed, have you 
you know, has there been behavioural change? And this slide, I often show this at conferences, I did this at your thing, but really asking, you know, I'm born on the 8th of April, anyone else born in April, we're about to sing a duet. Do you want to be Elton John or do you want to be Kiki D? Um, at which stage lots of people look very scared. Um, and it's really about that feeling of, I'm actually feeling a little bit nervously excited. Well, guess what? In order to think about being a leader in the future and, and changing behavior, you might have to be a little, feel a little bit nervously excited because uh, otherwise you're just going to keep doing what you've always done and we'll, we'll be like the sheep on the first slide. I think the key thing here as well is about engagement, isn't it? So if people are actually engaged with real life problems and their learning is uh, set around that. You can, if you, you know, you want to see the change, you can, you actually just watch, you can see them because that as they engage with it and problem solve around it, you can see, you can see the learning in action. You can see the improvement happening. And it's, it's so much better to see that live than see it in the sort of classroom setting. And it's kind yeah. of easy. Rianne, Rianne Cables asked a great question, which is, yeah. do you think having a strict cur curriculum to follow is best? For coaching or mentoring um or is it better to be more informal oh, look i think it's a blend of the two clearly lots of organizations would be down the formal end at the moment i think there's a, a growing movement towards the other end i think that involves a cultural change so lots of people would be reliant upon the formal now look really if the formal is impacting upon people and having positive effects and everyone's excited about it then carry on go for your life that may not suit everyone so be mindful that you know that lots of the well, what i'm hearing from people is this kind of informal just having the opportunity to go meet other people to talk about your problems preferably as you said in context um is having much more and i see coach development leadership development as we're doing it you know we're playing darts or we're, we're going for a, for a pizza and a beer and we're just chatting about the stuff that a we're doing well and b that's that's our problems at the moment and we're actually between between a group of us we're, we're solving problems and, and we're trying stuff and we're experimenting um i think it's a blend of the two but i do think that there needs to be a cultural change to, to get further towards the informal end I've, my feeling is that quite a lot of people do the form filling and do the sort of milestone moments, but then there's a devoid uh, of a great deal of content in between those milestone moments. So there's a lack of getting in behind and around people during the day that follows up. And that's so it's the informal part that needs emphasising. I just want to yeah. wrap up on them. Um, so yeah, so we'll, just one thing to think about with the knackered, probably the other thing is that how often do we do we celebrate those little moments along the way? So you're dead right. Yeah. If we do it every 12 months, then we may miss the opportunity to celebrate little moments. One of the things they did at Google was was originally a project about being brave. So they had little trophies. The other thing they did and that I really enjoyed was have the uh, and I won't swear, but it's a swear word that begins with F. So the F up cards. And when you had your PDR, if you hadn't used them, you were in trouble. So they were essentially going, we want you to go out and try stuff. So people would turn up and they go, well, I haven't used, I haven't used them, but I tried to use them 10 times. And it just turned out to be a brilliant idea. So you just never know until you try it. Uh, really good stuff. So just uh, picking up on the key lessons for um, modern leadership from Russell. Um, and I, I really love all this. So this just basic idea that how do we how do we get better? How does this uh, generational shift impact on us? And what are the challenges of that? And um, one part of that is to think like a coach. Uh, so, yeah, have your milestone moments uh, in terms of feedback and um, working out where you are and what's next. Absolutely vital to sort of do that lodestone session but then really a way more in, uh, effort on um in the moment in the meeting in the day coaching and that's much more about listening and being open and creating that intimacy so vulnerability as a leader is a really important concept and i think um not having a sense of status not getting sort of emotionally triggered about your ego and your position who you are your office all of that kind of stuff and instead just being open to not knowing and sharing that that vulnerability i think uh, gives everybody uh, permission to be open about their blind spots and their errors and it opens up a view of the world that you otherwise won't get because people just won't tell you yeah. and that leads on then to getting the insight of the group so you know there's a lot of expertise out there but this particular problem may be easily fixed or need a different solution and let's get different views on it everyone can see it from a different angle so let's open up to the wisdom of the group 
And I love this point about fully noticing. So someone might be angry, but maybe rather than just getting triggered by that anger, notice the anger as mm -hmm. a signal that they're nervous. And so that their response is to feel a bit angry and you hear it in their voice, but really they're just signaling that this is an important topic. Um, so rather than just triggering off the anger and reacting to that, you know, really notice what that means and watch the person and listen to what they're saying fully. I think it's a, <laughs> just to, just to, yeah, a good piece of advice I heard is listen for the story, not to the story. So if someone yeah. is angry and agitated, well, why? What's the reason for that? Actually stop listening to the story. Try and understand why they're telling you this. Yes, absolutely. Get to the root of it and understand it, understand what's going on for them. And then you get the motivation, you get the angle, and maybe you can find a solution that way rather than just dismissing the person as being emotional and angry or whatever. Um, important things to hear. So, and then this last point, which I think flows through this, which is feedback is not a form really. Feedback should be just a continuous process. But how can you do that if you're not connected with the people that you're trying to influence? So you need to be with them more, uh, which takes you straight back into being better as a leader and getting uh, your own coaching mindset on. Great session. Um, you mentioned this, so people can connect you here, uh, Rusty. So um, this will be up on the website and you can go and find Rusty's email address. But this is your Magic Academy. Yeah, so just as I said before, really, two and a half thousand people at the moment, coaches and leaders and kids and everyone around the world sharing sharing ideas on how to get better would, be, would probably be a summary of it. Um, Great way for clubs to get involved. Those, yeah, those no, just, anyone just drop me an email if you want to get involved or you know you're interested or curious about anything, just give me a shout and I'd love to help. Uh, we've taken a few questions as we go, and I'm just kind of mindful of the time. So um, um, if, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to fire them into the question area. But um, uh, my question to everybody out there who's still uh, listening, um, thank you very much for being on this today. Uh, and um, what is the one thing? from today's session that you're you're going to go and implement for yourself, for your team? What's the one thing that you think might give you a bit more uh, competitive advantage from today? Just take one thing out of this and commit to doing, and then we'll feel like we've done a great job. I think I've got a question in here. Uh, is there a pattern, uh, Gary Chambers asks, is there a pattern between the best coaches not necessarily having been um, uh, oh, <laughs> best coaches not having been the best players. It's a tough, tough question, Kerry. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I think you, you're always going to find exceptions to the rule. I think there's there's advantages to her having been a top player. So Richard Hill, MBE, played for England in the 2003 World Cup winning team, would be one of the best mentors of young players I've ever seen, and he could help support them with some of the feelings and the thoughts that went on when he was on the international scene. However, it's a completely different job coaching and playing. So it would be like me saying, oh, I've been with a few lessons as a student. I think I'll become a teacher tomorrow. So I think that, I mean, I think ideally you'd have a, you'd have a bit of a blend of both. I, I think there's also an advantage to being the player like me that didn't quite make it because you probably have some awareness of why you didn't make it. And you probably went through some struggles that were really key learning moments that hopefully you can stop other people uh, doing. Um, it's a great question. I actually think it's a, a bit like in, in your teams in business. It's a blend. So you wouldn't want a, a team, you know, a coaching team of ex -player, just ex-players who have no understanding of learning. However, I think if you were at the other end of the spectrum, you might be thinking we could do some insight from, from people that have been there. Yeah, yeah, I kind of want to take it the way around to say, could a top player be an automatic coach? I think that's a great way of fielding the question. Um, they're the guys that have to win on the pitch, right? And you're the guy that's there to help. Uh, well done. Um, so um, just uh, some heads up for next time's round. So um, on the 11th of October, there'll be an email coming round. Please join in. Uh, we've got a session on data strategy and disruption from a company called Two Circles. The founder of that's a guy called Matt Rogan, who's great. Um, so sports rights advisor. And then following on from that, we've got um, two ladies in leadership. Uh, uh, coming up. So uh, one past president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants on a modern approach to learning and um, also head of the uh, Equalities Commission coming up. So very different sort of leadership kind of models to be explored. So that's quite exciting. And then um, don't forget to go and uh, hop up on our, um, our YouTube site. All of these uh, videos are up there. 
Um, they're very popular, so you can go and share them with your team, watch them again, pick out the main points. This one will be up there sort of mid-morning, later on morning, and we'll let you know where, when that is. And then coming up on the 24th of October, uh, get in touch if you want to join in with this. We've got a high-performing teams myth versus reality session at the London Leaders Forum. So that's a three till six and then networking uh, in the centre of London. So let me know if you want to get involved with that. You can you can find out more on our, on our Get Involved page. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming on the session this morning. Thank you very much, Rusty. Uh, fantastic to uh, listen to you talk. I always love it. Some really, really cracking ideas and um, really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for having me. And I'll see you on the 24th, then. Yeah, so Rusty's going to be there. So look forward to seeing him. Uh, and um, Rusty's going to be taking us through some exercises on high-performing teams. So fantastic. Thank you, everybody. I hope you have a lovely day. Cheers.